Would you guys pray with me? Uh, God, as we just sing, um, more beautiful than the sun and the moon and the stars, more great and glorious than the mountains we get to see every day. You alone, God, are the most fair and beautiful of all things. And, and we ask that at this time and in this place, all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our lives would be focused on seeing your goodness and greatness, the beauty of your glory, take central place in our lives. And may that be so as we read your word and tune our lives to it. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. Um, if you have your program still, grab it and pull it out. And I want to ask you a question to start us off on our time together this morning. Here's the question. Why is my remote not working? That's the question. Because it's not on. That's the answer. Okay, here's a better question. What do you need? If an answer comes to mind, write it down right now on the paper. What do you need? If you were here last week, you heard me talk about a ski adventure I went on. And at the end of that really wonderful skiing experience I had, um, I said, you know, I think I need a new pair of skis, right? I think I need a new pair of skis because my old ones caused me to get hurt. It wasn't my bad decision that caused me to get hurt. It was the old skis that caused me to get hurt. I need a new pair of skis. I was talking to Micken and my cell phone cover recently broke and fell off. And I said, I think I need a new cell phone cover. I prompted you guys with all church email to think about this question. What do you need? Um, what do you sent me a picture? Apparently you were at the car show. <laughs> <laughs> and the text was something like, I'm just praying that God opens a door for this need. <laughs> Said apparently you want God to open a, a butterfly door. That's what you're looking for. Um, what do you need? When we ask this question, obviously, we have some terms to define. Because we use the word need in reference to a lot of different things. But the fact of the matter is, some of the things we talk about are not needs, they're wants. Some of the things aren't even wants, they're pipe dreams, they're wild impossibilities. Um, I, I'm just pretty sure that this friend who asked to remain nameless <laughs> probably is never going to get the $200,000 McLaren that, that picture was. Um, and so we have to, if we stop and think about our needs, we have to pause and be honest about how we use the word need to refer to a lot of different things. And if we're honest, much of the time, we might say, we might use the phrase, I need something when actually we don't need it at all. And I want us to think about that because the prayer, the part of the prayer that we're looking at today says, God, give us this day our daily bread. And that prayer is centered on an understanding that we receive what we need. We are provided for in our needs from God. And if, if we're going to understand that prayer, we have to understand the way that we think about, we process, we talk about our needs. Um, there's a few different types of sermons that, in my mind at least, um, we have together sometimes. One type of sermon is really content heavy. There's, like a, there's an idea and we have to talk about history and language and background. And we have to talk about that all so we can get an idea in our heads about God or about our role in God's kingdom. Another type of the sermon is a little more about our hearts. If the message of scripture stays in our heads the whole time, it's not doing what it needs to do because we believe it should transform us and it should transform us on the level of the heart. So some hermit sermons are times where we try to engage our heart, the depth of our being. Um, this morning is, uh, uh, neither of those, it's a little different. This morning I want to be about understanding ourselves. If we're going to really understand God's word and apply it to our lives, if we're really going to have God's word transform us at the heart level, we have to first understand who are we? What are our desires and our ideas? Why do we behave the way we behave and live the way we live? And so you'll notice that the program notes to do today are, there's just a lot of blank space. And the reason for that is because this is a understand yourself better kind of sermon and all the blank space is space for you with God to say, God, show me more about who I am today. 
That's what we're going to try to do. Um, we've been in this prayer. We call it the Our Father. Our Father is the first two words of the prayer Jesus gave. Sometimes we call it the Lord's Prayer because it was given to us by the Lord. Sometimes we call it the Disciples' Prayer because Jesus gave it to his disciples to pray. But here's where we've been. We started off and we heard Jesus' teaching that prayer cannot be about us getting a good spiritual rep rep uh, reputation uh, from the people around us. It cannot be about us, but rather it has to be about connection with our maker, the Heavenly Father. And then the next Sunday, we talked about what kind of a God are we praying to? And we explored how the God we pray to is the definition and the source of all that is good and great in the world. We pray to a God of overwhelming love. And third, we started the prayer. We looked at the first half of this prayer Jesus taught. And we said, Jesus seems to, to, to demand that the beginning of prayer is always getting ourselves focused on God's kingdom. A kingdom that recognizes God's glory, that desires the kingdom to grow, and that desires that growth by living it out through our thoughts, words, and deeds every moment of every day. That's where we've been. And we come now to a shifting point, to a turning point in the prayer. The first half was all about us getting our hearts, our minds, our lives focused on God and God's kingdom. And then, and only then, it seems, the prayer says, we now shift our focus to the needs of us here on earth. So, here is the prayer in full as recorded in Matthew's gospel. If you want to read it, it's page 884 in these red Bibles. Otherwise, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9, Jesus said, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So the part of the prayer that we're talking about today, give us today our daily bread. And I want to break this into three parts. Part one, the request, give us. Why is it that Jesus teaches us to start this prayer with the words, give us? Second part, today, our daily. Why is it that Jesus emphasized by repeating the present day nature of this request? And then third, bread. Why are we asking for bread? What if I'm gluten intolerant or celiac and I can't eat bread? Is that a problem? So the first part. Oh, there's the car again. Let's just go back and, ah, oh, man. So shiny. Uh, give us. The prayer starts. Give us. And it strikes me. When I asked you to think about what you need, and even when I thought through my life about what I say I need, a pair of skis, a new cell phone case, a new car, that question almost always gets answered in the singular. In the first person singular, here's what I need. Here's what I am lacking or wanting or missing in my life. And that's really not surprising because we live in America. And America loves the individual. We talk about, we think about our, the, the very air that we breathe as modern Western Americans is an individ, individualistic air. We are infected and saturated by a worldview that places the single person at the center of the universe. I am in the middle of my own little universe. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus does not say, give me. He says, give us. And so we kind of have to scratch our heads and go, well, Jesus, what does it mean to think about my needs, not as an individual, but as a member of the community? Every word in the prayer, every, every pronoun in the prayer up to this point has been in the plural. Our Father, give us 
our bread. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation. The whole prayer is in the plural. It's about the community. Well, it turns out that apparently um, modern uh, Western rationalist, individualist Americans were not the only type of people in the world. And it turns out there's a lot of other people who actually already know what it is to experience the world through a community perception. Um, a story came to mind. I remember hearing it. I'm pretty sure it was at this church, but I worked hard. I emailed a number of people. I said, where did I hear this story? Where did it come from? Um, I couldn't remember, but I have an image burned into my head from the story. Here's, here's how the story goes. Um, this person was on a, a mission trip in a developing world, and they were working at some sort of a school or, or maybe a children's home, and they were working with these kids. And as happens quite often, you spend some time in another country, um, you spend some time with kids who even though they're in the midst of um, great poverty, they, they go without very often, every day, they have such unbelievable joy. And you just fall in love with these kids. And so the person tells the story, and there was one day where they were talking with one of the kids that they'd sort of connected with. And they happened to have, the, the, the person telling the story happened to have a bag of candy. And so, of course, they're like, well, I, what am I, I going to do with this bag of candy? I can't just eat this bag of candy myself. So they're talking to this little kid that they know, and they say, hey, I, I want to give you this bag of candy. And the kid takes the bag of candy and immediately runs around the little playground that they're, that they're on and gathers every other kid that's at the playground. And they all come together and they sit down on the ground in the middle of this dirt field. And the picture that I remember, I think I saw it on this screen, the picture I remember was they're all in a circle and they sit down and they spread their legs out so their toes are touching. And it just makes this, I, you could sort of emit, imagine from the top this perfect little circle of kids with their toes touching. And the kid with a bag of candy passes it around the circle and they make sure that every kid gets an equal amount of candy. Because apparently, it's possible for humans to think not of themselves first, but to think of the needs of the community. And that's hard to imagine because for me, when I was a kid, after Halloween, it was all about guaranteeing and actually defending my right to my candy against that older brother and sister of mine, get your hands off, right? And we all have memories of our kids coming home with something that they love and they want and not immediately going, oh, I'd like to share this with my whole family, little sister, but rather hoarding and protecting and keeping to ourselves. So we see how unfortunately, and, and this is not, I don't, you know, I don't want to necessarily fault us as parents or our own parents, but for whatever reason, we live in a world where our self is the main focus that we protect at all costs so often. The second story, I was talking to uh, Mick and my wife about this, and she said, you know, that reminds me of a story um, that her grandma told. Her grandma grew up in, uh, on a farm in Iowa during the Depression. And living on this farm, her grandma was very, um, just, they, they were very poor. They lived with very little. Um, you know, sometimes they didn't have enough to eat. Uh, she had either six or seven brothers and sisters, and so lots of kids on a farm, not enough to eat, in the Depression. Um, and one day, Micken's grandma, Gigi, as we call her, Gigi remembers her dad brought home a box of Nilla wafers. You guys know Nilla wafers, right? The little vanilla, all of our mouths are kind of watering right now. I should probably go get some Nilla wafers. Um, so her dad brings home a box of Nilla wafers. And Gigi and the siblings go into like strategic planning mode. Now, they first, like the first story, they first evenly divide all the Nilla wafers, even cutting a couple to ensure fair parts to all kids. But then the kids get divided kind of into two camps. Camp number one is the kid who says, I get four Nilla wafers and I'm going to enjoy all four of them at once. Right? And I just want to take it all in. But some of the other kids 
divide out and they create sort of the Nilla wafer bank so that if I want to enjoy my Nilla wafers over the course of the next week, I can come to the bank and I can get what's mine and it's sort of tracked who has how many and what's left. And Gigi and her siblings at that time and in that place worked to ensure not that their own needs were met, but that the needs of the community were guaranteed when it came to this treasure of Nilla wafers. And so it causes us to ask, when we center our hearts and minds on God's kingdom, and we then receive the invitation from God to come to him, asking for our needs to be met, what would it look like if that request was first for us as a community and then for me as part of it, and not for me first, and then for us as a community. What would it look like in our life, in our shared mind, if we understood needs as primarily something we shared together? Church, how might we do that? Well, the prayer goes on to give us at least a couple clues. The next phrase, give us what? Give us this day our daily. The request is fairly small, simple, present, even immediate. I spent the day yesterday with the pastoral staff and all the council. Once a year, we come together and we just look back over the past year of ministry and we say, man, what are we celebrating? What's God been doing? Um, What do we see happening in the lives of this church community? And it's just an awesome time of celebration, of memories, of storytelling, uh, and and it's really sweet. And then after that, we kind of turn our attention and say, okay, based on that, where do we think God is leading us in the future? And we dream and we pray and we talk and we get excited. And what inevitably happens then is we say, okay, if that's the direction God's leading us, what provision do we need from God for that to be possible? If indeed God's telling us to go there, then what do we need to get there? But as I was reading again this passage and reflecting on that day, I recognized something. When I think about the future that God has for us, my mind always goes to big things. Over the next 10 years, we're going to have this gigantic impact and there will be you know, hundreds of people's lives and this, and it's this grand vision, which I believe is a good thing that God wants us to do, is dream big dreams for his kingdom. And yet, the invitation is to turn to God and recognize his provision, not necessarily for the big, for the grand, for the huge, but rather for today. And I think woven into that is, is what does it look like to be satisfied with the needs being met for today? To be satisfied with the needs met for today and to trust that again tomorrow our needs will be met and again tomorrow. The background of this text very likely A lot of the people that Jesus was speaking to at that time in the first century, they would have been day laborers. Their whole reality, their whole existence would have been, I go and I work for a day. At the end of the day, I'm paid one drachma, and that one drachma allows me to survive for one day. I work one day, I eat one day. I work one day, I eat one day. Now, does that mean it's wrong for us? to do long-term planning. I mean, if so, that's a problem because, you know, we pay our electricity bill once a month and we kind of got a plan for that and we pay our taxes maybe once a year or twice a year and we kind of got a plan for that and as we get uh, more healthy as a nation, we live longer and longer past our working years and maybe it's smart to save for retirement. Are all of those bad things? Are we doing wrong when we plan in the future? No, I I don't think we're doing wrong. I think there's plenty of other scriptures that say that type of planning is good and proper. However, here's the danger. When so much of our life is planned so far out into the future, and for those of you that are really good planners, (laughs) uh, you know that there can come this point where the plans are so secure and the preparation is so much that we forget that actually In this very moment, we are still dependent on God 
for our well-being. Case in point, to what degree are you able to guarantee that the percentage of oxygen that you're breathing right now is just the right mix so that it can come into your lungs, be somehow miraculously transferred from air into the liquid of your blood, go throughout your whole body into your muscles so that your heart can beat, so that you can stay alive. Who here, I mean, is any of you responsible for making sure that that all happens? Okay, nobody's raising their hand. Good, that's the right answer. If you weren't breathing right now, would you be able to work the job you work, to make the income you make, to provide for and meet the needs? No, I'm quite certain that if we were not breathing, something we have zero control over and complete and utter dependence on, if we weren't breathing, we would have nothing. And what we've planned for the future would be irrelevant. And so, in a world of long-term plan planning and preparation for the future, we're invited to remember that no matter how good the plans are, every moment of every day, we live in utter dependence on God's provision in our lives. And maybe, if we shift from a self-sustaining, self-made, I depend on me mindset, if we can shift from that to a utter dependence on God mindset, maybe it'll be a little more natural to think of needs as something we share together, not just hold ourselves. And then last but not least, give us today our daily bread. What's meant by bread? Why does Jesus use bread? Um, there's kind of two answers to this question. Uh, when I prepare to preach, I spend a fair amount of time thinking and praying about us as a community and just saying, God, what message do you have for us? Where are you leading us as a church? And also, I, I spend a lot of time, I really enjoy doing this, reading books, reading scholars, reading um, people who spend their lives studying this text and explaining the significance of it. And this word, bread, it got a lot of attention. Very exciting word, this word, bread. I need to, I need to take you on a brief um, theological sidetrack. Crucial, but brief. So there's a word I want you to, to learn. Maybe you know this. The word is eschatological. Everybody say eschatological. Oh, you were with me already. You're just right there. Eschatological or eschatology is the study of the end of all things. Why does it matter how all things are gonna end? That's a fairly big abstract idea. Here's why, because throughout scripture, there's this story that's being told, and the story goes like this. God created all things. Clearly, if we look around, the creation that God made, which the Bible tells us was a very good creation, it's really messed up. The story of scripture tells us that, and when we open our eyes and look around, or even not look around, just look at ourselves, we see there's plenty of things that are not very good in the world and in our lives. But the story continues and says, whatever hope, whatever hurt, whatever despair, whatever brokenness we see, we come to serve God and worship God because God promises that all things, all the hurt, all the brokenness, all the failure, all the wounds, God is going to restore and redeem and bring healing to all things. And if that's true, that gives us great hope. If it's true that God is bringing this world somewhere good, that God has accomplished what's necessary to restore all things, then that gives me hope, a hope that I can make it through this day even if this day is hard. And that's what eschatology is. It's the study of where is God bringing these things and if it's really a good destination, then that vision of the future can give me hope for today. So maybe bread, maybe this whole prayer actually is a prayer that gives us hope, which is what we need to get through the day until God makes all things new. Maybe bread just means the hope we have in the goodness of Jesus. All right, I can get on board with that. Because I do hope God does good things, and I do hope his power is enough to overcome the brokenness I see. And if that's true, yeah, that sustains me through my day. Um, there's a second realm of interpretation. And it says maybe bread 
means bread. <laughs> it's a little more straightforward, right? And it suggests that maybe what Jesus is saying is in order to stay alive as physical people with physical bodies walking around, we need to eat bread. And we don't need a lavish, uh, uh, luxurious diet in order to stay alive. We need some calories, probably some water, hopefully some fruits and vegetables. The kids, kids aren't in here, but fruits and vegetables, kids. Um, and so Jesus is teaching us to depend day by day on God to provide the basic necessities of life. And bread is an image of, of the simple, of the plain. I'll suggest, maybe it's because I just want to make everybody feel included, what if it's both, right? What if what's going on here is woven into this prayer, as Jesus often does, woven into this prayer is indeed a vision of where God is moving all things. God is going to bring us to a place where the needs of all people, of the whole community, are provided for, and that indeed does give us hope. And yet, if our hope is for the good of all people, then that perspective changes our understanding of our needs. If my deepest hope is for the good of all people, then that changes how much I want for myself when I know for a fact that so many other people go without. And indeed, perspective can make a big impact on the way we understand needs, on the way we are grateful for what we have. Allow me to illustrate. I... Um, I was on a 25-day wilderness trip. I've talked about it before. Um, maybe someday we'll try to put one of these together for the church. It'll be great. I was on a 25-day wilderness trip. Nine days backpacking through the desert. 16 days canoeing down the Rio on the border of Texas and Mexico. And on the whole canoe portion of the trip, my trip leader, Ken, had this gray bucket. Not this gray bucket, but a gray bucket that looked very similar to this one. And a few different times on the trip, Ken would reach into the gray bucket and he'd pull out a surprise. Um, I remember the day he pulled out a bag of Reese's peanut butter cups. And it was just like, oh, I've been eating dried vegetables and rice for 20 days. And these Reese's peanut butter cups are amazing. So it was the last night of the trip and Ken pulled out the bucket. Um, it was our last dinner together. The next day we would paddle just a short distance, pull out, go to the vans, you know, go probably eat fast food or something like that. Um, so it was our last night together and Ken pulled out the bucket. And we were making our dinner. I don't remember what the dinner was. Um, and Ken got one of the little, this is what you use backpacking or camping, is just the flimsy little cutting board. And he pulled out the cutting board and he pulled out the knife. And for our last dinner, he pulled out a head of cabbage. Now, in general, cabbage is, I don't know, it's not that exciting, right? I think we would all agree it's a fairly um, plain food. And yet on that day, Ken took the cabbage and he cut it up into slices and what we did is we passed it around and we just ate it. Oh. oh, I haven't eaten any fresh food for a month. Oh, and it was just the most unbelievably wonderful taste that I could possibly imagine. And we just sat around in a circle and ate chunks of cabbage. <laughs> Here's what strikes me about that. Give me a piece of cabbage right now. It's, I mean, I don't know. It's fine. I like cabbage. It's, it's not great. But in that moment, because of my perception of the world around me, because of what I've been living and experiencing, because of my context, because of my, my vision of reality, that changed my experience. It, it changed the very taste and flavor of the food that I was eating. A food that normally I would say, oh, great, thanks, cabbage, suddenly in that moment was a luxury. It was overwhelming. It was joy producing. Because of my perception of reality, I was deeply satisfied 
with the most basic of provisions. And so, that causes me to wonder, church, if God's kingdom truly takes center stage, sits in the very core place of our lives, if the coming of God's kingdom is the definitive, the driving desire for all that we see and all we know, then just might it be possible that when we seek for God to provide our needs, we actually could consider the needs of the community coming before our own. And could it be possible that if that is our, truly our greatest desire, then even the most simple things in a world of overindulgence, in a world of luxury, in a world where we have more choices than we can even handle, could it be that maybe we would find ourselves more and more satisfied with even the most basic and simple provision that God needs? Maybe Day to day, we'd even be satisfied by, wow, God, you let me take another breath. But how do we do that? We can talk about it. We can think about it. So I've got two suggestions for you. First, I think food is um, an appropriate reminder to us because one, um, I'm guessing most of us will eat around three meals each day, most every day, for the next week. And so here's my invitation to you this week. Um, first, just try and be aware of the wild, luxurious diversity of food that we all most likely get to eat every day. Just be aware of it. Just notice it. What would it look like to notice the food that you're blessed to eat every day? And second, sometime this week, during a meal, I don't know when, take something plain. Maybe go and get a piece of cabbage. Or maybe while you're eating breakfast, just a plain piece of toast. This week, while you're eating at a meal, eat something that is the most basic, plain, uninteresting food you can find, and consider what it would take to be deeply grateful for that simple provision from the God who makes the sun shine and the rainfall, so that every piece of food we eat is provided not by our own hand, but only because he gives us what we need to make it so. What would it be like to learn and practice gratitude for the most basic provision this week? That's my first invitation. What would it look like in the realm of our eating and drinking every day to define our needs and learn gratitude based on the kingdom of God? Second, um, the world we live in is a uh, economy where money is the uh, unit of exchange for everything that we have, all that we need, the, the clothes we wear, the house we live in, the shelter we have, the food we buy, we deal with it all, um, largely removed from the natural cycle of sun and rain and soil, but rather we deal with it all with cash and credit card neatly laid out in front of us at a grocery store. And similarly to food, the money we have is ultimately, I believe, and this is what Jesus is inviting us to consider, it's ultimately there for us because of God's provision. So my second question is, how do we define our financial needs and how do we learn gratitude based on a vision of the kingdom of God? And so here's my invitation to you. Um, we're purposefully having um, the offering come around during this last song. In just a minute, we'll sing the last song. The ushers will come forward. They'll pass the baskets. We do this little ritual every week, right? We take these little wicker baskets we have, and we pass them up and down the aisles. Some of us put a check in it. Some of us put our Connect card in it. Some of us give online or have automatic withdrawal from our bank accounts or text to give through the app. Here's what I invite for you. Whether or not you put check in the basket. When we take the offering, when you consider, am I going to give financially to the ministries of this church? Just let that act of taking the basket and passing the basket be a reminder to think about your finances through the lens of God's kingdom. 
Here's why we take an offering. I see two big reasons. Reason number one, we as a church have a number of ministries that I hope and I pray and we work together to make sure a number of ministries focused on bringing the kingdom of God into the lives of more and more people. We do that by helping people who are hungry or need clothing or need shelter, hopefully finding what they need so they can survive day to day. We do that by helping people come into community and relationships where this type of thinking can get ingrained into their hearts and their minds so they can live kingdom-minded lives. So we take an offering to support the ministries that we have. Another big part of the offering is to continue to fund the building we have and the staff that we pay as a church. And why does that matter? Because as a staff and with our building, our purpose is to multiply that kingdom ministry that we're carrying out. The idea is simple. If we're being effective in carrying out lots of kingdom ministries, then there should be some people who put a little more time and energy into helping make that work, not just so that we as a staff do it, but so that we as a staff usher this community into multiplying kingdom impact. And if that's true, then every dollar that's given in our offering is given, we hope, and we believe you hope, is given to build God's kingdom and expand it into more and more places. So what would it look like every time the basket was passed, whether or not you put something in it, to let that be a reminder of God, with all that you've given me financially, how do I place your kingdom in the center of that part of my life? I'm going to have the worship team come forward when they um, start this next song. The ushers are going to come forward. And with that, would you guys pray with me? Our Father, We pray to you this day because you are indeed the God from whom we learn the meaning, to to whom we look to as the source of all that is good and great, for indeed your name is holy. God, we desire for your kingdom to be more and more real and present and manifest in the life of Centennial Covenant Church. And God, may each of us and all of us together choose to think and act and live according to your kingdom. It's real in heaven. Help us to embrace that reality here on earth. And we pray, God, for us, that together you would provide for us what we need to live out your kingdom call on our lives. Where we've failed and fallen short, we ask your forgiveness. And indeed, where we've been hurt, where others have failed us, may we live lives of forgiveness granted to them as well. We know that there are forces working against us, that the evil one desires to tempt and trap and tear us down. So God, deliver us from those evils and those temptations. And we pray these things looking to you, our God, our provider, the bringer of the kingdom. We pray these things to you, our Lord Jesus, our heavenly Father, Holy Spirit. Amen.